much, yeah. Um, so, but that's, that was great. That really helped kind of introduce what I wanted to talk about, which that's, that's unity tonight. And this is an issue, issue, this is a problem in the church that I get really passionate about because I hear us talking about how Jesus, God is love, Jesus loves us, we are to show God's love. And then I kind of see in the world how, how the world seems to favor division. How the world seems to get into the church and take an issue that shouldn't cause a problem with us and kind of wedge it in and cause people to split. Cause, you know, somebody offends you, so you're like, I don't want to be a part of that church anymore. I don't want to go near that person. I can't serve God near that person again because they offended me, right? Because they believe something different than me, et cetera, et cetera. So what, what I want to make sure or try to get across to you tonight is that unity is greater than division, not just in the church, but in everything, in, in all of our lives, I mean, everywhere. So I want to show you a diagram, maybe, there we go. So this is a pretty good diagram of division, found it on Google Images, if you're interested. Um, you can go find it. Um, but this is kind of what the world sees the church. They kind of see us on one side, off by ourselves, you know, like we don't want to be a part of the world at all. And that's not how it's supposed to be. We're supposed to be kind of, Rocky and I were talking about this last week, we're supposed to be little like, these are, these are red people, the world. We're supposed to be little blue people in here. We're supposed to be set apart, but in the world. But unfortunately, this divide changes when we're talking about the church. Instead, it goes to church one versus church two with the divide in the middle, or more applicable to us, church person one versus church person two. None of these issues are generally based on the gospel, the most important thing. They're generally cultural issues or personal conflict. Like I said, somebody offended you or offended me or believes something different. Um, so. There is only one thing that's worth division in the church. Now, this is the one, only one thing. This is it. And that's the gospel. That's the truth that Jesus died and was raised, on the, uh, was raised from the dead. That's it. That's the only reason why you should be splitting as a, as a, as a church. Um, so, but I want to go through six of those reasons why we're divided. And I want you to, while I'm doing this, I want you to think about how many of these reasons actually go towards that one reason I just gave you. Is that one excuse to divide? How many of these reasons actually go directly with that? First one is homosexuality. Second one is universalism. Third one is politics. Fourth one is evolution. Fifth one is women in ministry. And my personal favorite, number six, the internet. So whatever the internet means, I don't know what that means, but the internet. How many of those talk about Jesus? You can answer. Like zero. You're correct. Great. Nice. Hundred um, percent. Zero of them. Now, I'm not saying that none of these things we need to talk about because most, a lot of these things are mentioned in the Bible itself. There, the apostles talk about it, but none of them are central to what we're working for. We're not working for any one of these issues. We're working for Jesus. We're working to spread the gospel. The world is going to try to tell us that these. If you know, if I have a different political candidate that I like, which is coming up next year, I don't want to be in a church with you. I can no longer serve Jesus next to you because we don't agree on politics. Doesn't make any sense. Doesn't make, you know. But I'm prone to that one. That's, some, that's one that I'm prone to. Um, and I'm sure a lot of us can kind of relate to things on that list. So, but Jesus actually gave us a great little insight in his thoughts on us being unified. He specifically mentioned that in one of his final prayers in John 17. Um, I'm going to go ahead and read this one. I've given them the glory you gave me, so they may be one as we are one. I am in them, and you are in me. May they experience such perfect unity that the world will know that you sent me and that you love them as much as you love me. Father, I want these whom you have given me to be who you have given me to be with me where I am. Then they can see all the glory you gave me because you loved me even before the world began. I want to highlight one piece in here, and that's this one. May the world experience such perfect unity that the world will know that you sent me and that you love them as much as you love me. Notice the first thing he talks about right here is actually the world. So kind of what Keenan said in his, in his you know, introduction is that when we are together, the world can see who we're here for. When we're unified towards Jesus, disregarding all those other things, the world can see, they, can, they kind of notice what, what we're doing here. 
They kind of, they, they, can, they can tell that. Um, so Jesus' biggest thing was that he wanted the world to see who he is through us being unified. So I'm going to give you a few other examples from the Bible. Most of these, actually all of these come from Paul. Um, I don't envy Paul. He seemed to have had to deal with a lot of these little things inside the church. I'm sure there were more that he didn't come through. But one of the big ones in the first century was who could become Christians. Has anybody read the book by Andy Stanley, Irresistible? Anybody read that? Some of us. But he kind of goes into this issue. And it was a, it was a really big thing in the first century because Jews were asking who could become Christians. So put yourself in a Jewish mindset in the first century. You had lived your entire life trying to be perfect under the law of Moses. You ate the right foods, you washed at the right times, you sacrificed at the right times, and all of a sudden Jesus comes in and he opens the door for everybody, for all the Gentiles, all the pagans, anybody, no matter what they were doing. I'm gonna click through some of these. They were trying to tell people that you have to become Jewish to become Christian. And that's not what Jesus said. That's not at all what Jesus said. He opened the door for everybody. He said that in order to be a Christian, you have to know Jesus. That's it. That's the only requirement. You don't have to be Jewish at all. So this is what Paul says. And I want you to kind of, I want to let you kind of laugh at what he says here a little bit, just kind of how he says it, because there are some things in here where he just, he's kind of, I, kind of, I love how he says this. So, oh foolish Galatians, who has cast an evil spell on you? For the meaning of, of Jesus Christ's death was made as clear to you as if you had seen a picture of his death on the cross. Essentially, he's saying that you would not know the meaning of Jesus' death if it hit you in the head with a baseball bat. Essentially what he's saying. Let me ask you this one question. Did you receive the Holy Spirit by obeying the law of Moses? Of course not. You received the Spirit because you believed the message you heard about Christ. How foolish can you be? After, after starting your new lives in the Spirit, why are you now trying to become perfect by your own human effort? Have you experienced so much for nothing? Surely it was not in vain, was it? Again, I want to highlight this section right here. And I want to kind of draw your attention to the human effort part. So if you think about it, anything that divides any of us, whether it be our personal issues, whether it be in the church, is because we're trying to make somebody else perfect on our own. We're trying to hold somebody else up to our own standards. We're trying to hold ourselves up to our own human standards and not by God's standards. So he's saying that, you know, after you are given the new, life, the new life in the Spirit, you're now trying to tell those other believers that they need to be held up to your standard in order to become Christians. And that is just one of the few examples here. There's another one in Philippians. Now, this is, a, this is the division in the church between two ladies. And this can seem kind of simple to you until you think about the fact that the church was splitting in between. There was some people that were taking sides with this person. I, I looked up how to pronounce it. I'm not going to try again because I know I'll say it wrong. But, um, there were people taking sides with this person and people taking sides with this person. And you know how that can be. It completely it was splitting the church in Philippi apart. So he said, please, because you belong to the Lord, settle your disagreement. And I ask you, my true partner, to help these two women, for they worked hard with me in telling others the good news. They worked along with... Clement and the rest of my co-workers whose names are written in the book of life. So, this section right here. And I ask you, my true partner, to help these two women, for they worked hard with me in telling others the good news. So, what he's saying is that they are working as well. They are working to spread the good news, even though you disagree with them, even though, you know, whatever these two people did, I have no idea. Apparently it was something pretty big, because the church was having some trouble with it, but um, they're still working for the good news. They're not working for any of those six issues that I just showed you. They're not working for any of those. Why are those impeding us, and now talking about us, why are any of those things impeding us from spreading the good news? All these people, their names are already written in the book of life. I may disagree with Kenan on something, okay? But my name's still written in the book of life. Kenan's name is still written in the book of life, no matter what, right? Because we believe in Jesus, because we're working for the good news. goes on to say, always be full of joy in the Lord. I say it again, rejoice. Let everyone see that you are considerate in all you do. Remember, the Lord is coming soon. I'm not going to stay too long on this one, but I'm just going to again point out to, to let everyone see that you are considerate in all you do. It's another one of those things that when we are united, the world notices. When we are coming together, I don't know 
if anybody, if any of you were here several years ago when Grace Chapel and several other congregations around coming came together to do a service project. We did a whole lot of service project, and it was not just Churches of Christ. It was, I think we met at the Methodist Church down the street. So it was this massive group of people that we said, we don't care about our little issues. We want to come together and serve the community. And we want to show God, show, show the community God through our service. So Paul continues, don't worry about anything. Instead, pray about everything. Tell God what you need and thank him for all he has done. Then you will experience God's peace, which exceeds anything we can understand. His peace will guard your hearts and minds as you live in Christ Jesus. His peace, some of that can be the unity that we find with each other. Because when you have somebody really close to you, or a group that you're really close to, that you're not divided, how much peace does that give you? If that peace can be, if that unity can be with the body of Christ, that can do amazing things. Last one. And now, dear brothers and sisters, one final thing. Fix your thoughts on what is true and honorable and right and pure and lovely and admirable. That's Jesus. That's what I'm talking about. That's none of those other things that, you know, politics. That's my big one because that's, that's, that's the one that I struggle with. Politics. That doesn't matter. Just fix your eyes on what is true and honorable and right and pure and lovely and admirable. That's Jesus. Think about these things that are excellent and worthy of praise. Jesus. Keep putting into practice all you've learned and received from me. Everything you heard from me and saw me do it. Then the God of peace will be with you. So i got one more example for you from 1 Corinthians. This one's a pretty famous one. Um, you've probably heard this before. I appeal to you, dear brothers and sisters, by the authority of the Lord Jesus Christ, to live in harmony with each other. Let there be no divisions in the church. Rather, be of one mind, united in thought and purpose. Somebody tell me what that thought and purpose is. I've said it like 12 times. Jesus. Jesus. For some members of Chloe's household have told me about your quarrels, my dear brothers and sisters. Some of you are saying, I'm a follower of Paul. Others are saying, I follow Paulus, or I follow Peter, or I follow only Christ. Has Christ been divided into factions? Was I, Paul, crucified for you? Were, were any of you baptized in the name of Paul? Of course not. And he goes down to say, For Christ didn't send me to baptize, but to preach the good news, and not with clever speech for, for fear that the cross of Christ would lose its power. So, Christ didn't send any of us to baptize each other. We're baptizing people in Christ. He, he sent us, he, he commissioned us to go and tell people that good news so they could be baptized in Christ and be working to live up to Christ's standards, not our standards, right? We, yeah? Okay. I just covered that. So there was a speaker that I found on Right Now Media. Um, he had a great quote that I wanted to share with you on this. And it is, unity is based on love more than it is agreement. So that's how it gets into, like, how are we going to live this out? We see this in the Gospels. We see this in the letters to the churches. But it's like there's so much division in our society right now. How, how in the world are we going to do this? Because we can't control everybody, right? You can only control you. And that makes unity difficult sometimes. Because as much as you may want to control somebody else's actions, you can't do that. So um, the way that we do that is we love each other. We love each other no matter what they believe. We encourage and build people up. We tell people that, you know what? That's okay that we don't believe the same things. That's okay that we disagree on this one little issue because I still love you. We both still love Jesus, and we're both still working for the good news, right? True unity will always require a sacrifice, and that's the sacrifice of your own will. When you're willing to tell somebody that, you know what? Yeah, you kind of offended me last week. You, you did not. That was a really big deal for me. But I'm going to lay that down because I want to still be able to work for Christ with you. There's no reason, like, what does it do for us as a, Christ, as a community of believers or for Christ if we're divided amongst each other? And instead of working for the good of Christ, we have one person over here doing one thing, one person over here doing another thing, instead of us all coming together and working for one purpose. So we have some great examples of this. This is our team in Mexico. Anybody been to Mexico? It's amazing. They are on top of a house scrubbing grime. It doesn't look too bad there, but it's about 98 degrees with about 3 million percent humidity outside. <laughs> Why else would we, we, we all come together? Why else would you do that unless you love Jesus? I bet you each one of these people has a different viewpoint on politics 
or evolution, or the internet, whatever that means. But <laughs> they all have a different view on that. But they're out there in the hot sun sweating like you won't believe for Jesus, for those kids that they're serving. We came together a few weeks ago with another youth group. We joined together with another youth group. And I can tell you, we probably have different views. And we went down into inner city Atlanta and served a bunch of kids for the day. Sorry, that's the best picture I could find. I know some of you don't like to see yourselves eating, but that's a nice Emily Green right there. <laughs> India, too. Has anybody, how many of you have heard about the trip to India? The trip to India is like a two-day trip, and then when you get there, it's hot and it smells bad, and it's just, you know, it's probably not the most, like, fun thing to actually be in India. But people love it because they're working for Jesus. They're doing, this is, this is Kurt Picker. He spoke here several months ago. Um, but I mean, he goes there all the time and just the team here, the stories I hear from that, from that trip are incredible. And they're all doing it for one reason, and that's Jesus. They're setting aside all of their different things, all of the different reasons that they may not like the person next to them to do that. A bunch of you just got back Friday, I believe, from New Orleans. A team picture from you from that trip. They came together with another youth group as well from Texas. Am I right? Yeah. Texas. Okay. And from what I hear, it was an amazing trip. I did not get to go on that trip, but it was an amazing trip. And again, I bet you that there were some people on that trip that didn't necessarily like everybody in the other group. I'm sure, there was somebody that the group found a little annoying, and they just kind of they wanted to keep their distance, but they didn't because they had to come together for that one purpose. Here's another picture from that, uh, from that trip. So, we need to show Christ's unity by the way that we love each other. And one of, like I said, one of the ways that we can love each other is by encouraging one another. We can be the force that builds each other up in the body instead of the force that tears each other down. The world is out there all, and when I say the world, I'm talking about non-Christians, are out there trying to tear you down everywhere we go. Anything you do, they're going to try to tear you down. Why don't we be the body that builds each other up? Why don't we look like Christ in that way. So we're going to do that. Don't move yet. But we're going to all get in a nice big circle. Did they make your last year we did the encouragement circle? Yeah. We're going to do one of those again. <laughs> so we're going to get in a big circle. Listen to me just a second. I'm going to start off in the circle. I'm going to encourage somebody, that person that needs to say something about somebody else. And it's just going to keep going around. Does that work? Everybody understand? Let's get in a circle. Thank you.